the back of the room? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to make it louder. Oh, good. Welcome to this evening's program brought to you by uh, the League of Women Voters of Brookline. My name is Margaret Bush. I'm president of the League here at Brookline. Um, we, we know that many of you uh, in the audience tonight are members of the League of Women Voters. We hope uh, people who are not members will consider becoming members. Uh, we're a group of men and women uh, interested in uh, encouraging voting and voters uh, we, we're working tomorrow with uh, the Massachusetts uh, League of Women Voters is uh, sponsoring tomorrow uh, Voter Registration Day. So we assume that everybody in the room is registered to vote. If you're not, please get ready to vote. Uh, we're always concerned about the turnout for voting. Uh, the League always has a very nice uh, voter's guide for our local elections and we sponsor uh, a forum uh, for local elections of the candidates, uh, usually held right here in this room and some of you have been to that program too. Uh, we want to encourage you uh, to look in on our website. Uh, we uh, keep notices up there. We sponsor a, a coffee conversation once a month uh, at Panera's and Coolidge Corner. Uh, that's always on the second Friday morning uh, of the month. And everyone is welcome to come. You don't need to be a member of the League of Women Voters, but we uh, encourage you to come and participate in the conversation. Uh, you saw tonight on the table, uh, and some of you, I think, uh, have them in, in hand, uh, this booklet. Uh, which uh, lists for us uh, the uh, matters that will be voted on in November. And we want to remind you that the Massachusetts League of Women Voters uh, is particularly concerned about the bottle bill, uh, the expanding of the bottle bill. And that's addressed in the pamphlet. Uh, occasionally, from now until November, we may need some volunteers. Uh, to, to help either with voter registration or with campaigning for the bottle bill. Uh, let's move on to tonight's program, which uh, will be fun to hear and thought-provoking, I am sure. Uh, Larry Lessig has uh, received a lot of attention, and some of you have heard him recently uh, as he moves on to talk about some issues that are very important to him. and. Uh, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, it's all about money. Uh, most of us in the room, not everybody, there are some of you who are younger uh, who won't remember, but a lot of us in the room remember a time when a million dollars was a lot of money. And we didn't talk about billions or trillions of anything. Those were concepts just out in the blue, too big to even think about. Today, a million dollars is not so much money. And Larry Lessig has become quite concerned about some big bunches of money and how that money uh, affects our political structure and uh, our political life in this country. And we're very pleased that he's here to share some of those thoughts and uh, to stir up some conversation here tonight. So uh, without uh, further comment, Larry Lessig. Thank you, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm really happy to speak at a place that's just about a mile from where I live, um, so I can get home and put the kids to bed tonight. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about an idea about how I think we should understand our so-called democracy in America. And I introduce it with this word, tweetism, which is a little obscure, I'm sure, but by the end it won't be. But here's how I want to introduce it. On August 31st of this year, the Standing Committee of China's 12th National People's Congress 
issued a decision that described how the procedure for electing the chief executive of Hong Kong would be established. Chief executive, like the governor of Hong Kong. Since 1997, that governor has been selected by an election committee. Uh, but in 2007, China said that the chief would be elected by popular vote in 2017. And so at the end of last month, Hong Kong learned something important about the nature of that, quote, election by popular vote. As the dictate, dictate from the China Central Committee described it, the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. <laughs> so about 1,200 citizens will sit on this broadly representative nominating committee, which means out of a population of 5 million, about 0.024% of the population will get to pick the candidates who get to run in the general election. So this is the structure of democracy in Hong Kong. There's an election where all the citizens get to vote, but then there's a nominating committee, the 1,200 get to vote. So to be allowed to run in the election, you've got to do very well in the nominating committee. You have to be one of the top three candidates, and that's the structure of democracy in Hong Kong. Now, that structure has been criticized. Occupy movement in Hong Kong called Occupy Central has said that that nominating committee is dominated by pro-Beijing business and political elite. So the nominating committee is not representative, and therefore they say this is not a democracy. OK, now, Hong Kong is not alone in having a democracy like that. It's a little better than others, but not alone. Iran, for example, has an election where all the citizens get to vote, but there's a guardian council where the guardians get to vote to pick the candidates who are allowed to run in the general election. So to run in the general election, you must do very well with the Guardian Council. There are about 12 people on the Guardian Council for about 50 million people in Iran. <laughs> or the Soviet Union, remember that entity, right? The Soviet Union, there was an election where the citizens got to vote, but the Politburo, where the commies voted, determined who got to run in that election. You had to do really well in the Politburo to have a chance to run in the general election. So there were 19 people who got to select for about 270 million people. So if Hong Kong is not a democracy, these are not democracies either. We could call them maybe fake democracies following like fake Steve Jobs on Twitter. But I think the better way to talk about these democracies is to call them boss tweed democracies. Boss tweed democracies. Boss tweed famously said, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. The nominating. These are two-stage democracies where we could call the Tweedies control the first stage of those two stages. And of course, the consequence of a Tweedy democracy, obviously, is that we get a government responsive to the Tweedies and not necessarily responsive to the people. All right, you might look at that and you say, well, this is all very foreign. What's that have to do with us? <laughs> You know, we don't have democracies like that here in America. And I, I suggest first you look a little bit back in our history to recognize that indeed we did have a democracy very much like this. 1870, the United States ratified the 15th Amendment, which said that votes could not be denied on the basis of someone's race or previous condition of servitude. But then after that, for 100 years, Okay, you're saying he's exaggerating. I am. For 95 years after that, <laughs> there was a concerted effort to exclude African Americans from the right to vote. Nowhere more dramatically than the great state of Texas, which explicitly in its law said that only whites could vote in the Democratic primary. Blacks were explicitly excluded in the law from voting in the Democratic primary. So in the Old South, we had a general election where all citizens got to vote. But there was also a white primary where only whites got to vote. And to, do, to run in that general election, you had to do extremely well in the white <laughs> primary. So this two-stage democracy is a Tweedy democracy. And the consequence of this, of course, is we had a democracy responsive to whites only. OK, now you're saying, all right, that's foreign, and this is an old story. Now what does this have to do 
with democracy in America today. We don't have anything like this anymore, do we? And the answer is, would that it were so. Because let's think about democracy in America today. We take it for granted in America that campaigns will be privately financed, which has evolved into a system where members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress to get their party back into power. This leaked memo from the Michelle Nunn campaign describes how she was supposed to spend 80% of her time raising money, except in October, where they said she was allowed to reduce it to just 50% of her time raising money. Now, the thing to think about is what does it do to these people as they spend their time dialing for dollars for 30 to 70% of their time? And the obvious answer is they learn something as they do this. They learn something. They learn what they must say, which buttons they must push. B.F. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box, where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson. <laughs> As the modern American congressperson learns which buttons must be pushed so that he or she can get the sustenance they need to thrive. As they do this, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> okay, so they're dependent on these funders, these funders to fund their campaigns. Who are the funders? Who are the funders? Well, I looked at the data to find what we could think of as the relevant funders. People who give enough money to matter to the candidates, so that they give enough so the candidates are worried about what they actually think. And if you think about the relevant funders in our political system, I think it's no more than about 0.05% of the political system we could call relevant funders. These are the people who are being called, which means at most it's about 150,000 Americans, which as the internet tells me is the same number of people as are named Lester in the United States, <laughs> which is why in my TED talk I called the United States Lester land, this place governed by these Lesters. And after the Supreme Court's decision this year in McCutcheon versus the FEC, that number is going to fall so that it, I think it's going to be no more than about 35,000 relevant funders of campaigns, which turns out to be the same number of people as are named Sheldon in the United States. And then if you think about the people who fund campaigns indirectly, a uh, possibility created by a case called Speech Now, the so-called super PACs, that number is even smaller still. So in 2012, this was my favorite statistic, 0.000042% which as you know, um, obviously, is about 132 Americans, constituted 60% of the super PAC money that was spent in that last <laughs> election cycle. 132 Americans, which I take as about the same number of people as are named Adolf in the United <laughs> States right now. So whether it's Lesterland, Sheldon City, or Adolphia, the point is it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the 1% who dominate this first stage of the election. This is tweedism, tweedism. Because what we've got now is a general election in the United States where we all are allowed to vote. Some states of you have an ID, but okay, all are allowed to vote. But then we have a green primary in the United States where the relevant funders get to vote. And to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the green primary. You don't necessarily have to win. There are people like Jerry Brown who sometimes succeed even though they don't have the most money. But in general, the campaign managers will tell you, you need to win the green primary to have a shot in the general election. So 0.05% of us determine the opportunities that will govern the 313 million who are represented. Now this picture is obviously meant to evoke not just our past, but the pattern I've pointed to internationally. This pattern of tweedism is a pattern where a significant portion of the population is excluded from this critical first stage of the election. But 
Amazingly, of course, you know, in the Old South, the defense of the white primary was that at least a majority got to participate. In the New America, it's the tiniest, tiniest fraction of the 1% who get to participate in this green primary. So people are excluded. Now you say they're not totally excluded, and that's right. The Supreme Court was right in Citizens United when it said that people have the ultimate influence, ultimate influence over the elected officials, because after all, there is a voting election where everybody gets to vote. But they have that influence only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. So they are excluded where it matters, as Bostweed would have said in the nominating. And of course, the consequence is a democracy that is responsive to the funders and maybe only to the funders. It's an incredible study by Martin Gillens and Ben Page from Princeton. I'm going to put that away quickly because we don't talk about Princeton much here in this part of the country. Um, that was the largest empirical study of policy decisions by our government in the history of political science. And they tried to track the relationship between what our government actually did and the attitudes of average voters, the economic elite, and organized business interest. And they tried to see what did our government respond to. And as the paper concludes, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. And what that means is, this is the, the terrifying graph, that bar, that red bar, says that regardless of how much average Americans care for a particular result, it has no effect on what our government actually believes or does. And if I instead had the bar of economic elites, you would see as the percentage of economic elites care about a result, it's more and more likely to be adopted. Organized business interests, more likely to be, to be adopted. But the average voter has no statistically discernible effect on what our government does. This is tweetism. And tweetism is alive here and around the world. Okay, that's what it is. What does it do in our government? This is Francis Fukuyama. I'm sure you recognize him, his work, The End of History and The Last Man, great political theorist who in his recent writing says, we should understand America not to be a democracy, not to be an aristocracy, not to be a plutocracy, not to be a kleptocracy. We should understand America to be a vetoocracy, a vetocracy, a vetocracy, meaning a government where it's trivially simple to veto reform. Now the reason this has become a vetocracy has something to do with the f what the framers of our Constitution did, but then the way in which money has overlaid what the framers of our Constitution did. The framers gave us what they called a republic, by which they meant a representative democracy. Now, as a representative democracy, it wasn't a pure democracy. Nobody ever imagined every issue would be directly voted on by the people. It was a complicated democracy. It was complicated with the intent to make it hard to pass change or legislation. So think of it as a kind of Swiss watch, complicated checks and balances, so that if any change were to happen, it would happen only with very strong support by a wide swath of the public. Now imagine with that Swiss watch, you begin to pour some honey right down into the gears. It doesn't take much of an imagination to understand what would happen to that watch, because this turns out to be exactly the consequence of setting up this as the way to fund elections, given the complicated Swiss watch-like checks and balances of our current system. Because this way of funding elections means that the tiniest number of Americans, really a tiny, tiny number, look, it's really small up there, right? Tiny, tiny number have the capacity to block any reform, which means that change, really any change, whether it's from the left or the right, any change within this system is going to fail 
because it's trivially easy to organize a subset of those funders who oppose that change and have them leverage their enormous power inside this complicated system to block it. So I don't care which side of the political aisle you come from. I don't care which issues are most important to you. Whatever the issue is that you think is the most important, I think I can show you how no sensible reform will happen because of the way we fund campaigns. And so until we change how campaigns are funded, on the full range of the important issues we face, there will be no sane policy possible. We are like a country whose steering wheel has come disconnected <laughs> from the drivetrain. And as we know, any nation that can't be steered will soon sink. This is what Tweedism does. In our democracy, it creates the vitocracy that Francis Fukuyama describes. Okay, so what should we do about it? There's a really large proportion of America which believes that there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing we can do about it. They look at the Supreme Court and they say the Supreme Court has made it impossible to do anything about it. The Supreme Court in cases like Citizens United have made it impossible to bring about any such change because to overturn the Supreme Court will require an amendment to the Constitution. An amendment to the Constitution proposed by Congress will require 67 senators to support it. 67 senators are not going to support an amendment to overturn Citizens United, so we're stuck. And the view is, therefore, there's little we can do until we change the court or invade Canada and get a significant majority of Democrats in the United States <laughs> Senate. Now, my view is that view is wrong. I could describe it a little bit more aggressively, but I'll be polite. So let's just call it malarkey. It's malarkey. It's malarkey because it confuses the need for constitutional change, which there may well be, with the absolutely critical change that we could make tomorrow in the way campaigns are funded. We could change the way campaigns are funded, not with a constitutional amendment, we could change it with a simple statute. A statute that established something, for example, which I described in my book, something like vouchers, where every voter would be given a voucher they could use to help fund small dollar campaigns, or as John Sarbanes has described in his By the People Act, a matching grant system where small contributions get matched in his system up to nine to one, so a hundred dollar contribution is worth a thousand dollar contribution. These statutes would radically change the way campaigns are funded, radically spread out the funder influence. So it's not just the Lesters who are the relevant funders of campaigns, it's also the Johns or the Marys or the more common American who has as significant a role as the tiny, tiny fraction of the 1% has now. A statute, which means what we need simply is a Congress that would enact such a statute through a majority or a special kind of majority in our Congress means 218 in the House and 60 in the Senate because of the way in which the minority can block change. So 21860, which I thought would be a pretty cool zip code. It turns out there is no zip code 21860. Pretty close to it, though, is Washington, D.C. So I think we should rename Washington as 21860, this idea of a majority enough to pass fundamental reform here, a Congress. So the question is, how do you get a Congress? that would pass fundamental reform? What do we need to do? And the answer is we need to elect enough members committed who have pledged to pass this fundamental reform. And the device which we've been given to bring about that fundamental change is the device called a super PAC. We call it a super PAC to end all super PACs. A super PAC to end all super PACs, the Mayday PAC which is committed to winning a Congress, committed to fundamental reform in the way campaigns are funded by 2016. 2016. Now you look at me and you say, okay, wait, wait, wait. You wanna use big money to end big money. Seems a little bit ironic, right? A little ironic, use big money to end big money. But I say we should remember the words of Lincoln, embrace the irony. Okay, Lincoln never said that actually, but Lincoln, <laughs> 
the man who did say we'd have a government of, by, and for the people, he would say that. He would have said we should use whatever means we can to bring about a restoration of the ideal that a democracy is to represent all of us, not just the tweeds, not just the tiniest fraction of the 1%. So we decided to launch this super PAC for the purpose of electing a Congress committed to fundamental reform. And we set this plan out that we said would accomplish that. The first step in that plan was to pilot the idea in this election cycle to prove that voters cared enough about this issue to vote to support candidates who support reform so that we could convince, especially the political experts, that there's a reason to try to launch a national campaign to bring about the number of Congress people we need to pass fundamental reform. And if we're successful in 2014, then in 2016, we will launch this much bigger super PAC to win enough seats in Congress to pass fundamental reform. And then in the first 100 days of 2017, after that new Congress is seated, we will get this fundamental reform passed. And then after the first Congress has been elected under the system of fundamental reform, we will prepare to protect that reform from any threats from the Supreme Court by enacting whatever constitutional changes are needed. So in 2014, we have picked a mix of races, about seven races across the country, where we will be running in a very diverse mix of districts and challenges to prove that voters care enough about this and to develop from this the data to convince skeptics that we can actually win on the basis of this issue. Now, we estimated the cost of this in 2014 would be $12 million. So the question was, how are we going to get $12 million? Um, I didn't have $12 million. I didn't know many people who did. So we had to think creatively how to do that. So I said, we would crowdfund a million dollars in 30 days. We set up a website. We said, give us a pledge. And if we hit a million dollars, we'll collect your pledge. And we have 30 days to make that commitment. And if we don't make it, we'll turn it off and we won't take your money. So we raised a million dollars in 13 days. And then we had six people who matched it, so that then we had $2 million. And then we started a $5 million pledge in 30 days, crowdfunded system to raise $5 million in 30 days. Uh, and the plan was, after that was reached, we would get that doubled as well by getting people to match what the crowd had funded. And so on the last day of this pledge, July 4th, because of the incredible intervention of this man, George Takei, Sulu from Star Trek, <laughs> who in the morning tweeted our campaign, and that one tweet earned us $750,000 from supporters on the net turning around and supporting us. As the fireworks were going off over the East Coast, we crossed the $5 million mark and achieved our goal of raising $5 million in 30 days. And if, and this is turning out to be a bigger if than I expected, but if, and I'm a little confident we'll do it, we can get that match, then we will have the $12 million for stage one, the stage where we want to prove through this pilot that voters care enough about this issue to actually vote for people who make this their issue. And that will then push us to the campaign to win in 2016. And if we win, then to pass in 2017. And then if we pass it, to prepare to pass any amendments that are needed to protect this reform from the Supreme Court. That's the plan. But the essential part of the plan is you. Well, not just you. We need more than you. But we still need at least you. But you to think about this project in a way that's particularly apt for a League of Women Voters meeting. To think of this project as citizens, not as Democrats, not as Republicans, but as citizens. Because what's striking about the current American political context is we forget that we are citizens before we are Democrats or before we are Republicans. We forget that we are not just partisan animals that think about politics just in this who's good and who's bad frame. But we have to begin to be able to think about politics in the way that our framers had to when they had to set up a system they thought could work. We need to recognize this system does not work. 
and that we have to step back from the partisan games inside of the system in order to create the change that would make it work again. And in doing that, we have to learn something from the incredibly important lessons of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement only succeeded when African Americans and whites worked together to bring about that change. The people who were benefited by that system of inequality and the people who were burdened by that system of inequality working together. And this change too requires not just left and right to work together, it certainly needs that. We can never get this change passed if it's seen to be partisan, either Republican or Democrat. But also rich and not working together. People who are benefited from this system and people who are burdened by the system. The 0.05% and the 99.95%. .9 we call them citizens, all of them. And what we have to do is find a way to rally those citizens to this movement that tries to say to our leaders, our political leaders, that we need to focus not on this issue because it's the most important issue. We need to focus on this issue because it's the first issue. It's the issue which, if we solve, would make it possible for us to solve all the other important issues there are as well. So, but why? Why is this so important? Why is this important to at least me? I'm, a creature that Fox News says doesn't exist. <laughs> I am a liberal patriot. A liberal patriot. I want to use words like, I love my country. I want to convince people to recognize what it means to have love of country. To have love of country. Because as a liberal patriot, when I see what we have done to the democracy that we inherited, a democracy that was never perfect, a democracy that was never perfectly just, a democracy that had made terrible mistakes in its past, but still, a democracy we were proud of, that the world looked to and admired. When I see what we have done to this democracy, I don't think that's just bad. That represents a certain kind of evil, a certain kind of evil. As Edmund Burke used to say, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. But when we think about most of our neighbors, when we think of most of this nation, with respect to this evil, most of us do nothing. Most of us have little that we have done to try to push back against this change. We are resigned to this. Now, I understand why we're resigned. At the end of last year, we did a poll that asked people, how important is it to you that the influence of money in politics be reduced? And the answer was 96% of Americans thought it was important to reduce the influence of money in politics. But the very next question was, how likely do you think it is that the influence of money in politics will be reduced? The answer is 91% did not think it was likely that the influence of money in politics would be reduced. Okay, so put those numbers together, 96% plus 91%. What that produces is the politics of resignation. We learn to accept what we think is not changeable because why fight what we can't change? So, at least 96% of us would love to fly like Superman, but because at least 91% of, of us are convinced we can't, we don't leap off of tall buildings regularly. We accept our human status and therefore go on, given that, res re that uh, reality. We are resigned to that reality. We are resigned to it. Death, taxes, and a corrupt government. This is just the way the world is. But what I want you to think is, is resigned okay? Is just letting yourself be resigned to this okay? Or as I want to change that a bit, is resigned what it means to love? Is that what love is? Because if you think in your own personal life, you think in your own personal life of those things that you might love, is being resigned to the challenges 
that might face them what love means. I gave a talk, I've described this in my TED talk, I gave a talk at Dartmouth. And afterwards a woman said to me, Professor, you've convinced me it's hopeless. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> and when she said that, I thought, okay, this is a failure. This talk is a failure. <laughs> because hopelessness is not what I want people to feel. But when she said that to me, for some reason, in my head, I had an image of my, my boy, who at that stage, at that point, was about six years old. And I thought, what if a doctor came to me and said, your son has terminal brain cancer. It's hopeless. There's nothing you can do. So would I do nothing? Would you do nothing? And the answer is, you know, you would do everything you could. The odds be damned. That's what love means, to do everything you can. The odds are irrelevant. And it wasn't much from that to the recognition that as a liberal patriot, that's the same point about the love for this country. The odds are irrelevant, even if it seems impossible. It's irrelevant. It is our obligation, those who say we are patriots, to do everything we possibly can to bring about this change, which will make it possible again for this democracy to function. Because this is the moral question of our age. Do we have the capacity to reclaim a democracy? And I think that question means, do we have the love to reclaim that democracy? Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions or? Yes, sir, over there. Uh, how would you get the news media to get on board what you're talking about? So that's a very hard challenge because the news media listens to conventional wisdom about what voters care about. So they feed that conventional wisdom back to the voters. So um, we were involved in a race in New Hampshire. It was a race where uh, the only Republican running for Senate in the nation to call for change in the way campaigns were funded was running against a guy named Scott Brown. You might have heard of that guy before. but. Um, He's moved from New Hampshire, uh, from Massachusetts, and now is in New Hampshire, and he's running for Senate in New Hampshire. So this Republican was running against Scott Brown. So you would look at this and objectively say, what's striking about this race is here is the only Republican in, in the nation willing to say there's a problem with the way campaigns are funded. And that alone, you would think, would be reason for the media to actually want to talk about it or ask about it. But in the debates, the debate of the Senate candidates, there was not a single question asked about this of the candidates. Instead, they were interested in asking questions like, who's the Democrat you can work with the best? Or tell me what your favorite part of New Hampshire is. Issues that you know, have nothing to do with helping people grapple with what should be the important issues here. Instead, talking about it in a way that just reflects the conventional wisdom. So that is why we think it is so important in the races that we're in to prove the conventional wisdom wrong. And if we can win some very difficult races or move the dial in these difficult races to make it impossible for the media to ignore the fact that Americans have voted on this, we think we can begin to change that conventional wisdom. And if we do, then I think they'll be happy to report this because it'll be an interesting story, but it'll take a real effort, which is what we're trying to do right now to achieve that. Yes, sir. Right, so the striking fact about Congress, as Jim Cooper, who's a member who comes from Tennessee, who went to Congress first in 1983, 
Cooper describes Congress as a kind of, quote, farm league for K Street, K Street with a lobbyist work. What he means is members and staffers and bureaucrats have a business model in their head. And it's a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So they go to Washington, they get the connections they need on Capitol Hill, then they trade out and they become a lobbyist. And for the members which were tracked in a study by um, Represent Us, the average salary increase for those members of Congress who left to become lobbyists was 1,452%. So in a system where you have an incredible return from supporting the lobbyists, it's really hard to understand why they would be willing to change the system. Because if you change the system the way I've described, um, you would radically change the wealth, the economic opportunity of being a lobbyist. Lobbying would be a much more normal um, uh, profession. Now, you know, I think government needs lobbyists. I'm not against lobbyists. But as John Edwards used to say when we used to quote John Edwards, there's, <laughs> there's all the difference in the world between a lawyer making an argument to a jury and a lawyer handing out $100 bills to the jurors, right? And our lobbying system doesn't understand the difference between those two. So a lobbyist is not just somebody making a great argument. A lobbyist is somebody who's also signaling the economic support for the campaign they're going to provide. And that's got to change. Now, if we change the way we fund elections, if, for example, we had a voucher system where every voter had vouchers and candidates could take the vouchers if they agree to fund their campaigns with vouchers and small dollar contributions only, that would displace the lobbyists. They wouldn't be in the center of the fundraising game anymore. And so they would not be able to promise the economic part to their argument. They would only be able to promise the argument part to their argument. So they would have a role, but they wouldn't have the central powerful role they have right now, which is one of the reasons why if we ever get close, they are going to fight this change with tooth and nail. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're talking about a strategy that tries to do this as quickly as possible, because the more time you give the other side to organize, the more certain the other side will be to defeat you here. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Uh, I have to stand yeah. up, please. Okay. I um, participated in the People's Climate March yesterday. And Bravo. Uh, thank you. And I see the power of the environmentalist movement. The environmentalists, though, see the problem with money um, wielding such influence in political campaigns. So one question is, uh, would you consider partnering with the environmentalists since there are so many people supporting uh, making changes there um, to further your cause? And the second question is that um, the Supreme Court has been very creative in finding laws unconstitutional. Um, how, would you, how would you structure your law so that the Supreme Court would not find your law unconstitutional? Well, let's take the second one first. Um, so the second part of the question was, how do we avoid the Supreme Court or the terror of the Supreme Court? Because the Supreme Court's been very active in striking down campaign finance regulation. Um, but the kind of regulation the Supreme Court has struck down is regulation that tries to restrict speech. It tries to say, you, a corporation, can't speak, or you, a union, can't speak, or tries to suppress the amount of political speech in the marketplace. And whether that's a good idea or not, for the Supreme Court to strike down those laws. The kind of change I'm talking about is totally different. The change I'm talking about is not trying to restrict anybody, it's trying to increase the amount of speech that comes from all of us as opposed to the tiniest slice of us. And the Supreme Court has signaled again and again that there's nothing constitutionally problematic with that. So the change I'm talking about would be perfectly constitutional. Either the vouchers or the matching grant system I think has no chance of this court striking it down, even though the court will continue to insist on Citizens United or cases like that. Um, so that's number one. Number two, with respect to the climate uh, or, or environmentalists in this march, uh, in, this, in this fight. Yes, what's happened in the last four years, I think, is that, um, or six years, is that uh, climate change activists, for example, who thought that Barack Obama was gonna get us climate change legislation, have slowly come to recognize that um, in fact, there will be no climate change legislation until we change the way elections are funded. Because, I mean, look at like Tom Steyer. Tom Steyer, who's this um, hedge fund guy 
who's spending $100 million to elect candidates who will pass climate change legislation. But he's, 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 he's in a system where he's standing up against an industry that makes $100 billion in profit every year. So God bless him for what he's doing, for trying to use whatever power he can to pass, get uh, legislators elected who will pass those changes. But he will never succeed until we change the way elections are funded because the other side will always have more than enough resources to push that back. It's the same thing with healthcare. You know, people you know, were fighting about Obamacare, forgetting the fact that Obamacare itself has incredible compromises built right into the core. For example, there's no public option, which would have been competition against the private insurance companies to keep the rates low. There's no private option because the insurance companies told the Obama administration they would spend $40 million defeating Democrats if the public option were in the legislation, so it was taken out. Or the prescription drug part of the legislation. The government is not allowed to use its power to negotiate lower prices from drug companies for drugs that are covered inside of Obamacare. Uh, why is that? Well, because the drug company said if they didn't put this protection inside of Obamacare, they'd spend 40, 80 million dollars defeating Democrats um, and Congress would have flipped to the Republicans. So again, they compromised because of the way elections were funded. You pick your issue. I think everybody is slowly coming around to what the climate activists are recognizing, that our issue is important, but we won't get our issue until we deal with the first issue first. And that's why I said, I'm not trying to convince you that campaign finance reform is the most important issue out there. God forbid. It doesn't even have a sexy title. It would be terrible if this were the most important issue. It's not the most important issue. It's just the first issue. It's the issue we've got to solve if we solve these other issues. And I think, sometimes think about it, the metaphor of an alcoholic, right? I mean, all of us have been touched by the disease of alcoholism, right? So think of an alcoholic losing his job, his liver, um, you know, his wife. Uh, those are really the most serious problems somebody can face, right? But what we all know is that he's not gonna begin to address any of these problems till he addresses his alcoholism first. That's the first step. And maybe he can't address the other problems, but we know he can't, he certainly can't, if he doesn't address that first. So I think we have to get those activists into this movement, not by convincing them to give up climate change, that would be terrible, but to give, convince them to devote a certain amount of their resources towards this cause too. I've tried to argue to Tom Steyer that he commit 10%, he tithe, 10% of everything he spends he gives to the reform movement. Um, and if we could get climate activists to do that, and healthcare activists to do that, and global and financial reform activists to do that, and people are looking at the debt to do that, if we could get all of these people to recognize this and give the movement for reform the support it needs, I think we could get the reform that would then make all of these other problems that much simpler. Yes, sir. Your description of the legislative approach the campaign finance was pretty brief. Would you expand on that for a couple of minutes? The mechanism, the total cost, sure. I, I assume the major cost is going to be to the government. What would that cost be? Uh, just general sure. expansion. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing to recognize is the objective of the change that I'm talking about. The objective is to increase the number of relevant funders in campaigns, to go from a world where Lester's are funding to the world where everybody is funding. And the two ways that I described to do this, one is a Republican proposal, one's a Democratic proposal. The Republican proposal is the voucher proposal, um, where everybody gets a voucher. The Democratic proposal is the matching fund proposal, where small contributions get matched. But let's focus because I've done the numbers on the voucher proposal. Let's focus on the voucher proposal. The voucher proposal would cost about $7 billion every two years, which means every year would cost about $3.5 billion. So you look and think, well, $3.5 billion is a lot of money. Until you start thinking about how it relates to the other money in our government's system. So the Cato Institute 
which is a libertarian think tank, calculates the amount of corporate welfare in our budget every year. Corporate welfare, meaning protections for corporations or special gifts for corporations that they otherwise wouldn't get if they didn't have the special privilege they have within our system. And they calculate the total amount of corporate welfare last year was $100 billion. $100 billion. So if a change in the way we fund elections would allow us to reduce that by just 10%, we could pay for the cost of this type of small dollar public funding of elections two and a half times over. Because liberating Congress from returning favors to these big corporate funders would give Congress at least a shot, a chance, to pass legislation that wasn't tilted in, in that way. So I think three and a half billion dollars is not chump change, but I also think it's a tiny investment relative to the huge return it would produce inside of our system. Because again, we'd be able to pass all sorts of change that would make sense, not change that increased the capacity of campaigns to raise campaign dollars. Um, so three and a half billion dollars, um, you know, it's kind of the amount the Defense Department spends over a long weekend. Um, uh, we spend, how much have we spent in Iraq and Afghanistan to help them advance their democracy? Um, I want to spend about one thousandth of that to help us advance our democracy too. Um, and, uh, and so that's, I think, the payoff, the trade-off that makes, makes this make sense. Yep, sir. Are you concerned about, um, if you are successful to get these candidates into Wisconsin, into Washington, um, Obama in 2007, I think a lot of people in the room probably felt like he was the type of candidate would represent this. He had a lot of small contributions. People talked about how he had that email list and he could activate the average voter. You have the party political process where you need to be part of that game of raising money, otherwise you don't belong to the Democratic or Republican Party. Why would these candidates be different? Well, um, in this cycle, it's not so important to us that the people get, that get elected bring about the revolution. All we're trying to do in this cycle is to prove that voters care about it. And if we can prove that voters care about it, then when we elect a Congress in 2016, um, I, I want to be the Grover Norquist of reform. I want, you know, they will take a pledge, and if they don't live up to the pledge, they will be taken out. So it's basic, you know, incentive theory here. How do we create the right incentives for them to do the right thing? Now, the thing to remember about the current system is nobody really likes it at all, right? And you think about a congressperson, you know. I, I, met, I met a congressperson after the last election um, he was from California, and he said to me, um, uh, you know, I ran for Congress in my pajamas. I thought, okay, he's from California, that's the sort of weird thing people from California do. <laughs> and he said, no, literally, I never left my house. The only thing I did was to sit in my house calling people all day long to raise the money that we then gave to the television stations to put our television ads on TV. And he said, but you know, I've gotten to Washington and I've discovered my job hasn't changed. The only difference is I'm not allowed to wear my pajamas anymore. And what he was referring to is they had just received that week a memo from the Democratic um, leadership outlining their model daily schedule. And their model daily schedule, according to the Democratic leadership, included four hours of fundraising. Four hours of fundraising. And that was just during the day. That didn't include what they did at night when they went to the cocktail parties or other types of receptions. So you think you get to Washington, you think you're there to help your constituents or to argue about the important issues of national concern, but really you're just a kind of not even well-paid telemarketer who sits there calling people to raise money for your party. They don't like this system. Um, and if you can give them an alternative that works better, they will opt into it. And the best evidence of this comes from Connecticut. Connecticut used to have a system like we have for Congress. Um, then there was a big scandal, um, and they changed the system so that they have small dollar funded uh, elections at the state legislature and for governor. And in the first year of that system, 78% of the elected representatives opted into the small dollar system. In the first year, Democrats and Republicans alike, these are the elected representatives. And the reason for that is their campaign managers looked at the system and said, it makes more sense for you to be out there meeting people real people than sitting at these cocktail parties trying to raise money from you know, the rich people in Connecticut. Um, so they just opted into a different system. They didn't 
have a deep desire to be tele telemarketers, they wanted to be politicians, and that gave them a chance to do that. So, so I think the thing is to create the uh, carrot and the stick. The carrot is a better kind of life as a member, as a representative, politics the way it's meant to be, meeting voters, trying to understand what they want. And the stick is if you, if you cheat us, we will be back, and uh, we, will, we will be back to make sure that you're no longer in Congress. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah. I'm on a um, digress or turn from, for a few minutes to away from money and campaigns to two other factors that I think have a terribly destructive effect on our democracy. One, and perhaps not even the most important of them, is the way we've all been taught that in the, in the, uh, the founding fathers discussed the right of the people to peaceably assemble for redress of grievances, and how much that's been made a mockery of in recent years. You know, we had Occupy Wall Street and every other major and some minor cities had their Occupy movements. And before too long, the, uh, the mayors and so forth uh, and, and the police of those cities were sweeping away these demonstrators and denying them the right to gather. And in another way, it wasn't the, uh, the law enforcement, it was the media, which minimizes and marginalizes things like this weekend's March in New York. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually seen coverage of it on TV. We've looked very hard and seen very precious little. So that's one piece. The second piece has to do with elections, but uh, the kind of psychological laws that are very, very tricky to change in getting people to vote for and support the candidates who they will admit stand for their values and for their visions of how the country can be better. And these are the people, and there are probably quite a few in this room, who have uh, argued against supporting particular candidates because, quote, he hasn't got a chance, or he will reflect uh, votes away from the lesser evil uh, so that the greater evil will win. I, I guess I speak as an unrepentant mayor voter when I say this. but. Uh, I think even with all the campaign finance reform in the world, if people aren't willing to choose the people that they, uh, whose visions of America they agree with, whether it's a mayor, a Dennis Kucinich, or in this state, uh, a Don Gerwig, uh, and, and stick with them regardless, uh, then I don't know that we will ever be able to think of people. And I think there's a real manipulation being uh, along this line being made up for the next presidential election. How many pundits have we all heard announcing that Hillary Clinton is the inevitable nominee? And whether the message in that is don't even think about who you might like better than Hillary because he or she doesn't have a chance. It's already in the cars and it's going to be Clinton and uh, forget, about, forget about fighting that. And yes. I think that is incredibly destructive. I mean, yeah, it's about these things. I mean, it is, it is interesting the way people feel like they want to vote for the winner in a certain sense. They don't want to be isolated, like I voted for the, for the woman who got 2% of the vote as opposed to I voted for the winner. I, I, I never quite understand that. But I think your question... You. Sorry? Can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm just saying it, it is surprising the way in which people feel like they have to vote for the person they think is going to win as opposed to the person they think actually reflects their views. But I think this points to a much more fundamental point um, which you know, I want to be clear about. Um, I don't think there's one problem with American democracy. I think there's a whole string of problems with American democracy. You know, the campaign finance is one, but gerrymandering uh, is another. Uh, the way the electoral college works is another. The entrenchment of just two parties is another. Um, you know, the way in which we have winner take all voting in districts is another. There are lots of things that we need to think about how to do better. Um, but what I'm talking about is the sequence of reform. Which reforms make other reforms more possible? So think about the electoral college reform. People say, you know, it's ridiculous that there are only 10 states in the United States that, um, where presidential candidates campaign because those are the only 10 states that are swing states and they ignore the rest of the country. So we don't get campaigning here in um, Massachusetts. Utah gets no candidates in Utah, but it's Ohio that gets flooded with candidates campaigning. Well, if we change that, which people are trying to change with the 
um, with a very elaborate hack on the system that will make it so even without amending the Constitution, you effectively get rid of the Electoral College. If we changed it tomorrow, instead of there being 10 states where candidates campaigned, they had to campaign in 40 states or 45 states, that would just increase the cost of campaigns dramatically. And if you increase the cost of campaigns without first addressing who's paying for those campaigns, you haven't changed the system. You've just made more powerful the Lester's inside of the system. Um, and that difference, I think, is something that um, reformers sometimes forget. They e we each get focused on the thing we care about the most, but we don't ask, well, what is the sequence that makes it possible for more, most of us to get what we want? Um, you know, even Obama, uh, you know, we forget you know, many kids don't even know, don't remember. There's nothing to remember. We forget that between Nixon and Obama, every single president was elected with presidential public funding. Um, nobody benefited pr from presidential fu public funding more than Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan ran three national campaigns on the public's dime. He would never have been a candidate in 1976 had it not been for public funding. The Republican Party was not going to give him money to run his campaign against Gerald Ford. So he is a perfect beneficiary of the system of public funding. When Ronald Reagan ran for re-election in 1984, he attended eight fundraisers, eight fundraisers. When Barack Obama ran for re-election in, uh, in 2012, he attended 228 fundraisers. But Barack Obama is currently attending a fundraiser once every five days. Now, now you think, the presidency is not a simple job, you know, it's not a simple job. But imagine in your own life, every five days, traveling to some part of the country and giving, giving you know, speech to raise money. The complete change, dramatic change that has consumed the office of the presidency and every other office in our government is really astonishing. It is no comparison in our historical past. Their main job is raising money from the top to the bottom. And I think that's the thing we change before we're going to make it possible for people to think about these other changes. Yes, sir. What, what if we did nothing? What if we just let the system improve? In other words, I don't think that we can take too many more Ferguson, Missouri, or that we can take another Occupy Wall Street, or that we can take another, um, say, uh, Trayvon Martin. Um, and that we can continue to incarcerate people at the rate that we are, with the cost being, I think I heard uh, a couple of days ago, that it was $62,000 to uh, keep a person in prison in California. Don't you think that the system would just completely collapse? Well, you know, can, do you understand Yeah, I, I get the question. So it may, may completely collapse. But look, if the system completely collapses, average Americans are going to be really poorly off. They are really going to suffer. And the Lesters, or the Sheldons, or the Adolfs, <laughs> those guys aren't going to suffer. You know, they, they have enough wealth inside the system to continue to build their own private universes, their villages, their planes, their you know, existence that doesn't depend on you know, public schools that actually work or infrastructure that's actually usable or public transportation that you can actually rely on. So the point is, if the system collapses, there will be people who lose. They are the same people who are losing under this system right now. They'll just lose much, much more. So I, I look at the system and I say, rather than just sitting back and doing nothing and letting it collapse, we actually still have the power to do something about it, right? There still is the capacity to vote people in and out of office. And it still is possible to vote enough in or out of office to make this kind of change. You know, we've done the numbers for 2016, and, and it's quite, assuming we can get a Democratic candidate for president who can rally the Democratic base again, and that might be a big assumption, um, but let's just go with me for a second. And we can get um, close in the House, uh, get a majority in the House. Then what we need to do is to find 10 seats in the Senate, or 10 votes in the Senate, just 10 votes in the Senate. And we've discovered in the work we've done in our campaign so far that Republicans, too, really care about this issue. They really care about the corruption of their government. But what 
for the reason that was pointed out earlier, and that really great question about people not willing to vote for what they care about, when Republicans are given the choice of voting for this issue, but they fear that voting for a candidate who believes in this issue will mean that candidate can't win in the general election, they will vote for the winner as opposed to the candidate that believes in what they care about. Okay, so that means go to states where there's a safe Republican Senate seat, where no Democrat will ever win that Senate seat, Wyoming. And in a state like that, start running in primaries candidates, Republican candidates who believe in this issue. So Republicans get the chance to say, okay, it doesn't matter which Republican we pick, there'll be a Republican who goes to Washington. But why not pick a Republican who actually is talking about this issue that we all think is ridiculous, this all of us believe the corruption of this system is, is ridiculous. So the point is, it's not a huge, impossible task. We're talking about 10 votes in the Senate, 10 votes in the Senate. And if we target it in a way that makes sense of how people actually vote, I think it's completely plausible. So I would much rather try to mobilize people for this kind of change than say to my children, okay, you know, 40 years from now, maybe we'll get enough support to recover from the inevitable destruction that will come from us letting it collapse. Yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. Your, um, metric of success for your first stage, and secondly, um, do you anticipate with having a legislation that causes campaigns to become publicly funded, you may incite some of the arms race between private funding and public funding. Have you looked into the breaking point at which private funding is no longer possible, or no longer profitable, and can public funding conceivably match that breaking point? Yeah, um, so the measure of success for us um, is both like what the public looks at and what the, the people looking at the data look at. So the public will look at it and we've got to win a number of these difficult seats so that we can say, look, this matter, we surprisingly kick somebody out um, who otherwise wouldn't have been kicked out. Um, but, the, but regardless of what it looks like from the outside, from the inside, we've actually got to have the data to show that we can spend money in a way that actually moves voters so that we can multiply it out. We need to win 20 seats in the House, we need to win 10 seats in the Senate. How actually can we do that? So that's, that requires real analysis, real data, and that's what we're trying to produce. Um, as for whether there's this arms race, well, in places that get the number right, like Connecticut, there wasn't an arms race initially. What there was is people switch over to the public system, and the public system dominates. And then if they don't support the public system, over time, you know, the private system can begin to dominate. But that's why I said in the plan that we've got to think about what constitutional change is necessary to make it possible to protect the reform that we're talking about here. So, so that, that means we've got to get the numbers right and we've got to build in constitutional protection to make sure that the numbers um, stay right. Um, but I think that there's a way to show, there, there's a way to get these numbers right because states have done it. Um, yes, sir. In other countries, I know that it doesn't help to mention other countries sometimes. Stand up, in, please. Yeah. In other countries, um, the cost of running a campaign is significantly less than it is here. What impact would your approach have upon the media, who I would suggest are probably central to the alcoholic analogy that you've already uh, yeah. Because until you can take some of that out of the machine, uh, they're going to just keep pushing it. I don't think it's an accident that the media come to New Hampshire and ask Scott Brown what part of the state he likes. Because they don't want to talk about a lot of the other things that they are talking about. Yeah. Um, before I started getting involved in campaigns, I didn't really care much about that question. Uh, now that I've been involved in campaigns, I, I care a lot about that question. Because <laughs> this is an insanely inefficient system for communicating ideas to the public to get the public to make a decision about who they should be supporting. Right, you just, just try it someday. Try writing a 30 second ad. You know, you get about 55 words. That's all you get. And in 55 words, what can you say that will actually advance any understanding of any interesting issue? Right, this is kind of like, this is like the pornography of writing, right? You've got, you've got to get stuff that kind of grabs people's attention. <laughs> And, and you're trying to evoke out of people kind of a grunt on your side or a grunt against the other side, right? And it's this very crude, 
incredibly inefficient form of communication. Like in, in, in New Hampshire, you know, 7% of New Hampshire's population voted in the last election, 7% um, of the population, not the voting, it was 20% of the registered voters, but 7% of the population. But I use the population number because I'm saying 7% has voted, but you're speaking through television and radio and, to, uh, and, and in the mailings and stuff to all of the people in, in Connecticut, so you're sp in New Hampshire and Connecticut and a little bit of uh, Massachusetts and all over because it leads everywhere. But the point is you're wasting such a huge amount of resources to communicate for such a tiny slice. Um, and the stuff you're communicating, people don't even like. They don't even want you to get. It's completely non-consensual communication. Like you're watching the Patriots and all of a sudden some ad comes on, start telling you about why Scott Brown's a criminal or something like that. And you're like, I don't want this here. I just want to be able to watch the Patriots. That's what I want. Um, and uh, and, and that's, that's the dynamic of political speech right now. Um, now we've thought about, and we're experimenting in this cycle, with techniques um, for flipping that around. In fact, um, uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, Gabriel Meister, uh, Gabriel back, back here, um, uh, has run it, ran something called a hackathon, participated in a hackathon this um, weekend where people were developing technology to help in the democracy fight. And one of the ideas we developed is imagine flipping this around so that you send a letter to a voter and it says in the letter, um, you know, go to, the web, go to this website, use this code, watch a 10 minute video. At the end of the 10 minute video, answer three or four questions. So we know you actually watch the video. And then afterwards, pick a Target card or a Starbucks card or whatever you want, and we'll send you a $10 or $15 or whatever the number has to be card. You know, instead of spending $200 per voter to get a voter, you know, just send $20 to the voter. Now, you're not asking them to vote for you. You're not saying in exchange for your vote. You don't even say who they should vote for. You just want, to, you want a chance to talk to them like I've been given the enormous luxury of talking to you um, so that, you know, people are paying attention, they're thinking a little bit as they're listening to you so that you can communicate to them about something more than just, you know, who they should grunt for and who should, they should grunt against. Um, now, we don't know whether this would work. You know, we want to experiment with it. We want to see what effect it will have. Um, because what we know is the current system is just totally broken. And if we're going to get movement on an issue like this, which, you know, takes more than 30 seconds to get people to understand, um, we're going to have to find a different way to talk about it. So this is, I, I completely agree with you. This is what we're trying to do with it. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Um, but we should recognize first, there could be two reasons why people don't show up to vote, other than just being lazy slobs. But let's put that one aside for a second. Two, two good reasons. Um, one good reason is they don't have much trouble with what's going on. My wife's on town meeting, so I'm sure that that's the reason people don't show up to vote here in Brookline, because they kind of think, well, you know, it's, it's okay. That's one possible reason. But the other reason, I think, is the one to be really worried about. They think there's no reason to vote. They think no matter who you vote for, it doesn't matter for the results. So, for example, Rock the Vote is a great organization that registers and turns out young voters, kind of League of Women Voters for kids in college. Um, uh, and in 2008, they turned out the largest number of young voters in the history of voting. Uh, but in 2010, they found a significant number of those voters were just not going to vote again. So they pulled them and asked them why. You know, you voted for the first time in 2008. Why aren't you going to vote in 2010? The number one reason by far, two to one over the second highest reason, was no matter who wins, 
Corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. So what they recognize is we live in Tweety land, right? We live in, a, this is Tweetism. They recognize there's no reason, so long as Boss Tweed controls the first stage, to worry about what goes on in the second stage. Um, and you can lecture them. You can say, no, you ought to go out and vote. But what I think is we ought to recognize it might make sense. <laughs> Given the current system, it might just make sense. They've got other things to do. They've got other things to spend their time on. It might make sense for them not to vote. And so that makes more urgent what I'm trying to uh, argue for here, that we change the system so we don't live in a kind of tweedy democracy. You know, we live in a system where, in fact, democracy is representative. And then when they don't turn up to vote, you say, you know, what's your excuse now? And if their excuse is, um, I like the system, then you're like, okay, fine. You know, there's no real worry here. But if their excuse is, I just didn't want to waste their time, then you've got to say to them, you have, you're not living up to your duty as a citizen. The citizen should turn up to vote. My only condition qualification on that is, so long as it's making sense in the democracy for them to turn up to vote, and this democracy doesn't make sense for them to do that. So I promised my kids I'd put them to bed. Can I just answer one more question and then I race home to? Okay, two more questions. One, two. Or three. One, two, three. That's it. That's it. But one, two, three. These are the best questions. These will be the best. So we'll start with you and then you and then you in the end, you'll be the final cleanup. So make sure you got a really great one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd love to comment on it because, you know, when, you, when I said, so the question is, the, the point was, I, in the beginning of my lecture, I was talking about the way in which you have these kind of nominating processes, um, which that's what I was saying Boss Tweed loved if he can control the nominating process. He didn't have to worry about the voting. And the question was, well, you know, parties in the United States were meant to be private entities. They were the process that was nominating people. And so when I told the story of like the white primary, many people think to themselves, how is it possible that there was a white primary for you know, 90, 90 years after, um, after uh, the Constitution says you can't exclude African Americans, how could African Americans be excluded? And the answer was the Democratic Party was a private organization. It was a private organization. So they get to vote for whomever they want and you can't force them to admit different people to their party, just like you can't be forced to invite different people to your dinner party, right? It's a private affair. And what the Supreme Court eventually recognized, something that I think is obvious to us right now, is um, it might be private in one sense, but when it plays a crucial role in the process of electing representatives, we have to guarantee that the process is open to all citizens to participate in. So the fact that you call it private doesn't justify excluding 15% of the population from participating in it. And what I'm trying to say is, if you think about it like that, the process we've set up for funding elections is like a primary. Now you can say in the same way, it's private, it's all perfectly private, and I say, yeah, it's completely private. It's private, that's the problem, it's private. Because it's private, 99% of Americans don't participate in it. So we exclude 99% of Americans from this process, whereas the white primary is excluded 15% from that process. And what's weird about this is, you know, we often, um, we often uh, um, are great admirers of the framers of our Constitution, and I am too. I, I think our Constitution is amazing tradition. But of course, the framers of the Constitution didn't care about racial equality. It was a slave nation. They didn't care about uh, gender equality. You know, women couldn't vote until 1920 in the United States, right? So racial and, and gender equality were not on their radar. What they cared about was wealth equality, not in the market, but in the public sphere. Ja uh, Madison, when defined, said, Madison said we needed a government to have a branch that would be, quote, dependent on the people alone. The people alone. And then he went on for Federalist Papers later to define the people. And by the people he said, not the rich more than the poor. Not the rich more than the poor. 
So what they had a conception of equality for was equality as citizens inside of our government. But we've totally destroyed that conception of equality because we have handed off to the economic elite, we've outsourced to the economic elite the funding of campaigns and they get a very high return for their investment. They're not stupid, that's why they're rich, right? So they get the return for their investment and that totally defeats the objective that Madison had for this kind of equality. So it's private, but that doesn't, doesn't mean it's protected. So then there was another woman here, yes. So Oh, you mean the elections that we're talking about? Yeah. yeah, so we so we are in seven races. Two primaries have happened. One was a Democratic primary, one was a Republican primary. We in the Democratic primary was in Arizona. Um, it was a safe Democratic seat. And what we saw in that race was that in a safe seat, we could message on this issue and Democrats would move dramatically to the candidate who cared about this issue and made this the issue. So we moved 10 points in that race. Our candidate won by, I think, 11 points overall in, in that race against, against, his, against his opponent. Um, and then we, the Republican race we did was a, was a much different type of race. Um, we supported Jim Rubens as the candidate in New Hampshire against Scott Brown. When we entered the race three weeks before the election, Jim Rubens had 9% in the poll and Scott Brown had 62% um, in the poll. So we weren't gonna win, um, you know, we weren't gonna beat Scott Brown. But we wanted to give Scott Brown a run for his money on the issue of money. That was our objective here. And, and you know, by the end, we moved the number to like 23.5%. So Jim Rubin's moved up substantially. But in the polling, which is what we were looking for, we found that 37% of the voters, the Republican voters, said money in politics was the determinative issue that they, um, they looked at as they, as they voted. And for those who said that, Jim Rubin's beat Scott Brown by 18 points. 18 points. So, this is the only thing we're trying to demonstrate to Republicans. If you talk about this issue, you will capture a significant portion of the Republican base. And in New Hampshire, in 2016, that's going to be a very significant fact. Because you imagine you're a candidate running for president, there'll be about 1,000 Republicans running for president in 2016 in New Hampshire, and you begin to look at the New Hampshire voter, and you think, geez, there's a significant portion who care about this issue we have created the incentive for at least one or two of them to begin to talk about it, to begin to say, as Republicans, look, maybe we need to think about this a little bit more because everybody thinks this is a corrupted system. So those were the primaries, and now the rest of the elections will be general. The rest of the campaigns are general election campaigns. Okay, the question we've been waiting for the whole night, this is the best question, <laughs> the last question, but the best one, so um, take a I, shot. I Yeah, yeah, I run that risk. <laughs> and uh, um, I've felt that uh, quite dramatically already because, you know, a lot of people are extremely skeptical of what we're doing. Um, but, you know, there's a certain, I have an, a certain kind of freedom, a kind of rare freedom in our society. I mean, I'm not rich, but I have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> which is this weird position where I can just say what I believe and uh, people like it, they don't like it, you know, as long as I'm not crazy, as long as it's sensible stuff that I would say, but say what I believe and I can't be fired for it. it doesn't, I, don't, I don't have to say what anybody cares about in order to continue to have my... And, and you know, that was part of the reason I felt like I had an obligation to do something about this because there, there are very few people in our society who have that freedom. They're rich people, but they're not, you know, very rich people. They have that freedom. But even they are afraid. There was this amazing race in New York um, for the governor, the Democratic primary. And my friend Zephyr Teachout, who's a very, very committed anti-corruption campaigner, ran against uh, Governor Cuomo. She had no money. Cuomo had $30 million. She had like $400,000. 
But I was, I was involved in a bunch of the efforts she tried to sort of get people to stand up and support her. And person after person, extremely wealthy people in New York, say, yeah, yeah, I hate Cuomo, I hate Cuomo. But I can't go against Cuomo, he'll crush me. And I thought, well, what, is this Russia? What do, you, what do you think he's gonna do, send you to jail? I mean, you've got billions of dollars. I mean, you can't, what are you worried about losing if in fact you have Cuomo as an enemy? But for them, it's very hard for some reason to be independent enough to stand up and say what you believe. And you know, if you're a lawyer, you can't say what you believe. There's all sorts of people who aren't free to say what they believe, or at least if they're free, they don't have any opportunity to say it. And I feel like I'm incredibly lucky. Um, and that luck entire, entails a certain obligation. Um, so I've told this story uh, a lot. Um, you know, I, I, was f I, I was forced to take up this issue by somebody I was very close with, um, a boy named uh, Aaron Swartz, who was the internet activist who committed suicide about two years ago, um, being prosecuted for downloading too many academic articles. Um, and they thought he was gonna share the academic articles, which of course is obviously a crime in, the, in, in, in America. Um, um, and after spending two years and all of his wealth defending against a prosecution where the US attorney threatened uh, when she announced the case that he would go to jail for 35 years for downloading these articles, after doing that for two years, he just lost hope and he committed suicide. Um, but I had worked with him for about 12 years in his life. He's, he died at the age of 26. Um, and, uh, and we had worked together on all sorts of issues around copyright and internet policy because he was a geek and that's what he really cared about. But in 2007, he came to me and he said, you know, why do you think you're ever gonna make any progress on these issues so long as there's this corruption in the way our government works? And at first I tried to push him away and I said, you know, this is not my field, Aaron. My field is, you know, copyright and internet policy. Um, and he said to me, okay, you mean um, as an academic? And I said, yeah, as an academic, that's my field. He said, okay, but what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And you know, anybody who's got kids knows that there's this moment when a, somebody who has this relationship to you calls on you to be the best you can be. And it's hard, it's really awful to let him down. And I kind of felt like when he said that to me, I didn't have an excuse. You know, I've been doing that work for a long time. Why not pick up this work? And if I'm called crazy or marginalized or kind of uh, um, fringe, well, that's too bad for the democracy. But it doesn't much matter to me. You know, I've got a family, I've got friends, I've got a job. Um, so I've got an obligation. I've got an obligation to do as much as I possibly can to find a way to get all of us to do what we can to get a democracy back. Because if we don't, you lose. You lose. You know, there's going to be social security when I retire. <laughs> Global warming, oh yeah, it's terrible. But guess what? My house is not going to be flooded. And healthcare, I'll have plenty of healthcare for the rest of my life. My life will be perfectly fine until I die. But you, you've got a really, really awful future in front of you because of what we did. Because of what we did. Now we have an obligation to step up and do something about it, but you have an interest in stepping up and doing something about it and rallying other people like you to do something about it. Because if you don't, if we don't, it's going to be pretty bad, pretty bad for you. Um, Your children. And my children, absolutely, my children. We need to go to bed. Thank you.